Under the pressure of a series of fragile negotiations on the brink of collapse, President Trump today tried to convince anyone listening that he remains the ultimate dealmaker, weighing his leverage in Venezuela's leadership struggle, walking a delicate line on the nuclear ambitions of both North Korea and Iran, not to mention his looming decision in just a matter of hours on whether or not to start a trade war with China. As CNN's Abby Phillip reports, the president picked a White House event about medical billing to air these international grievances. At a medical billing event turned impromptu press conference today, President Trump letting off steam as he struggles to make deals on the world stage. We can make a deal, a fair deal. With China? We were getting very close to a deal, then they started to renegotiate the deal. We can't have that. North Korea? I know they want to negotiate, but I don't think they're ready to negotiate. And Iran? What I'd like to see with Iran, I'd like to see them call me. Trump also pushing back on his national security advisor, John Bolton. As sources tell CNN, his frustration is growing that Bolton is pushing toward a potential conflict with Venezuela. I actually temper John, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? It's, I mean, I have John Bolton and I have other people that are a little more dovish than him. And ultimately, I make the decision. But Trump is the one talking tough on Iran. There a risk of military confrontation, sir? I guess you could say that always, right? Isn't it? I mean, you know, always. I don't want to say no, but hopefully that won't happen. Even calling for former Secretary of State John Kerry to be prosecuted for allegedly violating the Logan Act, which prohibits unauthorized people from negotiating with foreign adversarial governments. John Kerry speaks to him a lot. John Kerry tells them not to call. That's a violation of the Logan Act. And frankly, he should be prosecuted on that. A spokesman for Kerry saying, everything President Trump said today is simply wrong. End of story. Meantime, as North Korea provokes the U.S. with missile launches, Trump is urging Kim Jong-un to come back to the table. North Korea has tremendous potential economically. And I don't think he's going to blow that. I don't think so. And if the administration fails in their 11th hour bid to salvage talks with China today, Trump plans to slap higher tariffs on $200 billion in Chinese goods at the stroke of midnight as he takes a swipe at his predecessors. I blame the people that ran the United States and I blame their trade representatives and frankly, I blame our presidents. And President Trump also said that he received a beautiful letter from Chinese Prime President Xi Jinping today. Uh, and those talks are supposed to go on starting around 5 p.m. Eastern time here in Washington. They're also supposed to continue on Friday. But, Jake, if those 25 percent tariffs are put in place at midnight tonight, they will land like a thud both in Beijing and here in, on Wall Street. Jake. A lot of Wall Street jitters. Uh, Ab Abby Phillip, thank you so much. Uh, let's talk about this with the experts again. Uh, Phil, uh, let me start with you. The president spent a solid 40 minutes today, uh, I think it can be fairly called, uh, going off on, on China, North Korea, Iran, among the long list of other matters. Do you get the sense the president's worried about his next move in Iran? I th I'm not sure I'd say worry, but I think he understands what he's understood since day one, since he was born, and that is if he's the first out of the box with a message, whether it's on Iran, whether it's on North Korea, whether it's on Venezuela, then he can control the news cycle and he can control how Americans perceive the problem. He did that with the Mueller report. Most people aren't going to look at the details of what's happening with North Korea. The president can say, this is what's going on. I was right. I'll protect our security interests. So if you look at what's going on with North, North Korea, obviously with missile tests, the contrast to when he walked off the plane is dramatic. But he's controlling the message by getting out there. And I think a lot of people listen to him and wrote, won't read the newspapers, Jake. Uh, Nia, the president today accusing the former secretary of state, Democrat John Kerry, of telling Iran not to call his White House and violating the Logan Act, a spokesman for Kerry calling the president's claim simply wrong. I mean, if John Kerry is breaking the law, one would think that the charges would be brought. I mean, is he just making this up? It, it certainly sounds like uh, he's, he, he's just making this up, having a foil in, in John Kerry. And again, this is, I think, to, to Phil's point, this idea of a president who can set the narrative, and that narrative is often believed, often amplified by the conservative uh, chattering class, whether it's on, you know, cable news with Fox, or whether it's Rush Limbaugh. So it's something he has done. It's 
something that he hasn't really pl paid a political a price for at all in, in terms of trying to, to shape this narrative and sort of blame other people for why things aren't going his way. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying, uh, that somehow John Kerry is blocking any sort of progress uh, that, that he could make uh, with the uh, Iranian regime. We'll see if there's any sort of uh, pushback or clarification from this White House. Typically, there, there isn't. You go and you ask the White House what the president is talking about, and there's often just more obfuscation. It does in some ways remind me of an exchange uh, from the testimony that Bill Barr had with Kamala Harris, basically asking uh, Bill Barr whether or not the president had asked him to go after anybody and, and prosecute anybody. I mean, is this something that the president is asking if he believes that John Kerry has uh, broken the law? Is it something that he's asking Bill Barr to look into at the Justice Department? And speaking of falsehoods, uh, the president was asked about the fact that several members of the 2018 World, World Series champion Boston Red Sox team, uh, which today visited the White House, a number of players on the team uh, skipped the visit. Uh, let, let's play that exchange. Red Sox are coming in a little while. I like the Red Sox. What do you say to those who argue that you're too divisive and do you worry it's going to hurt your re-election? You know, it's interesting, Puerto Rico, just so you understand, we gave Puerto Rico $91 billion. Now, the, the president immediately uh, switching to Puerto Rico because uh, that's one of the reasons uh, the manager's not coming. In reality, we should point out, President Trump keeps on saying that they gave Puerto Rico $91 billion. Congress allocated $42 billion for Puerto Rico for, for recovery. Of that, $12 billion have been, has been spent. Um, some government estimates uh, that the budget uh, will uh, include another $50 billion over a 20-year period, but that's a very rough estimate. I in any case, uh, Kristen, the president keeps repeating this $91 billion, $91 billion. We've given Puerto Rico $91 billion. It's not true. It's a lie. Does that matter anymore? Uh, I think it's unlikely that the president's comments on this will lead, lead to any sort of immediate political price. But it is important to note that, say, uh, take a state like Florida, um, where during the gubernatorial race down there, you had Ron DeSantis, who wound up being victorious, someone who was a strong Trump supporter, really tied himself to the president. But even on the issue of uh, Hurricane Maria recovery in Puerto Rico, that was one area where he put distance between himself and the president. So in somewhere like Florida, that could be the sort of place where if the president's response to what happened with the hurricane in Puerto Rico is viewed as deficient, that is the sort of place where perhaps regionally he would pay a political price. Paul Begala? Uh, that's right. He only carried Florida, as Christian well knows, by less than 115,000 votes. Estimates are that anywhere from 50,000 to, I've seen estimates as high as two or 300,000 uh, Puerto Ricans have moved to Florida. They, of course, are our sister and brother Americans. They have a perfect right to vote in Florida if they go and register. I hope they will. Uh, so it's not, I think, that politically uh, astute. But, so why does he do it? Why does he lie? I think he's trying to redefine truth itself. You, you and I, normal people, we believe that truth is fidelity to facts. He believes that truth is saying sometimes racially inflammatory things that no one else wants to say, like Puerto Ricans are undeserving, like Mexicans are rapists, these things that upset me so much. I think he's, he, he's convinced himself that he can say these really inflammatory things that somehow that makes them true, even though they're factually false.